Good evening, you're watching No Spin. I'm Nidhi Razdan. The BJP celebrated its 42nd Foundation Day today at a time when it's grown bigger than ever. The Prime Minister is speaking there, talking about the party's big wins in the recent Assembly elections and once again stressing that dynasty politics was on its way out while he described what he called the nationalist politics of the BJP. Today, yes, the BJP does seem invincible, especially after these big wins in UP, which it won for the second consecutive time. That was historic and it beat anti-incumbency in Uttarakhand and Goa. But is there any real challenger to the BJP today? That's the question. Because the opposition is still disunited, the Congress is in a mess, though of course the Aam Aadmi Party and the TMC fancy their chances. But are these parties realistic contenders to take on the BJP in 2024? Joining us now, Yogendra Yadav from Swaraj India, Ajoy Kumar, spokesperson of the Congress Party, Mr. Mahesh Verma of the BJP, and we'll be joined by the Aam Aadmi Party, Saurabh Bhardwaj, in just a moment. Yogendra Yadav, is the BJP invincible? Uh, no, certainly not. And I think the whole, the name of the game is to appear to be invincible. I'll simply put simple facts to you. There are about 4,100 assembly seats in this country. BJP currently holds about 1,300 or so. So of less than 35% seats. Does that make them invincible? No. Second fact, look at the parliamentary constituencies. Travel from Bengal to Kerala and then some other places where you have independent parties that are taking on the BJP. That gives you about 190 seats of this country. BJP would struggle to get 50 seats out of these things. Look at the second belt. Second belt would be Karnataka, Maharashtra, Jharkhand, Bihar, which is where coalitions matter. If there are decent coalitions of the opposition in these places and some other allied places which account for 150 seats, BJP would struggle to get 75 out of these 150. That leaves 200 seats, which is UP, the whole of East, uh, North India, Hindi heartland and Gujarat and places around that. That's 200 seats. Actually, now, if I could interrupt, it's interesting that you say that because Mr. Chidambaram was on this program a few weeks ago. And he made the same point that the, the next election is going to be state by state. Are you, saying, are you saying the same thing, that it has to be fought state by state? Uh, no, I'm not saying that. I'm looking at belts. And I do look at this entire area from Uttar Pradesh, the entire Hindi heartland up to Gujarat and so on, as almost one block. So I'm not looking at it state by state. I'm looking at region block region. by block. And all I'm saying is, that the reason for BJP's spectacular success is that in these 200 seats, from UP to Gujarat, the whole North India, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh included, this is where BJP has swept every time in the last two polls. If a resistance can be put up there, if BJP can be restricted to 100 seats out of 200, which is not a bad number for BJP. So getting 100 out of these is the name of the game. If that can be done. Let, let me get Mr. Be, Mahesh Varma's response to this. Uh, that, uh, that the game today is that the BJP wants to appear to be invincible, Mahesh ji. Uh, whereas the reality might be different. What do you say? तो निश्चित में हमने जब भारतीय तंत्र के माध्यम से शुरू की तो हम तीन सीट लेते थे इसके बाद लगातार हम बढ़ते रहे निश्चित सत्तर में हमने महेश जी आपकी आवाज आपकी आवाज थोड़ी कम आ रही है और लेट लेट्स जस्ट ट्राई एंड फिक्स इट हम हम वी विल कम बैक टू यू इन जस्ट अ मोमेंट सौरभ भारद्वाज ऑफ द आम आदमी पार्टी इज ज्वाइनिंग अस एज वेल सौरभ भारद्वाज that the AAP is clearly very clear that its national ambitions are now front and center. We saw Arvind Kejriwal and your other senior leaders today in Himachal campaigning there. They were in Goa a few, uh, sorry, in, in Gujarat a few days ago. Uh, but are you really serious contenders to take on the BJP in 2024? Uh, or is that premature? I, I, are you looking at a longer game, 2029? Uh, I think we are looking at 2024 and we are looking at 2029 as well. And I I believe, uh, Nidhi, that uh, when people of this country elected Mr. Narendra Modi, uh, they elected him with a lot of hope, a lot of aspirations, you know. Uh, 
I remember when you know he was elected, people thought that you know he will bring Gujarat model, which meant economy, which meant trillions of foreign investments, which meant lakhs and lakhs youth getting jobs, which meant thousands of smart cities across India, which meant bullet trains running across India. It meant almost everything which you can think of. And there, Mr. Modi used to compare us with U.S. and China. But in last seven, eight years, nothing of this sort has happened. There is a. I'm only asking whether you're jumping the gun in your national ambitions. Are you spreading yourself no. too thin, too quickly? No. What we believe is that uh, people are upset that BJP and Mr. Modi did not deliver what they thought. But I have travelled across many states, Nidhi. What I find is that people are angry with BJP. They want an alternative, but somehow there is a mental block which has been probably created by BJP that people don't want to vote for Congress. They believe that Congress carries a huge baggage of corruption. Uh, Congress doesn't have a leadership. There is a lot of infighting. Uh, so you're is, hoping to is, step into that space? Is, is, so, is so what you're saying? So we hope that 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 set of people who don't want BJP. And are not ready to vote for Congress. Will vote for Aam Aadmi okay. Party as a whole. Okay, M Mahesh Verma ji is back with us uh, from the BJP. Uh, Mahesh ji, let me ask you this: that if the BJP was to look at who its principal challenger is in the next election, do you think that this principal challenge will come from Aam Aadmi Party or can it come from a united opposition? No, this will not come from party. ये बीजेपी का जो एक ध्येय है नेशन फर्स्ट जो उसकी चुनौती जो है वो अपने आप से है इनसे तो हो ही नहीं सकती है क्योंकि इनका ध्येय ऐसा है ही नहीं ये ऐसे ध्येय लेकर चलते ही नहीं ये तो सत्ता को जो है अपने सुख का एक माध्यम बनाते हैं सुख के वजह से सत्ता किसी एन किन प्राकेंट जो है ये हासिल करने का जो इनका सोच है जो समझ है जो इनकी एक नीति है नियत है उसके ऊपर ये चलते हैं तो अगर हम इनको कहीं सामने रख के अपने काम को करेंगे अपनी चीजों को लेके आगे बढ़ेंगे अपनी नीति अपनी नीयत को कहीं पब्लिक और देश से कनेक्ट करेंगे आप, आपको चुनौती अपने आप से ही है बिल्कुल है बिल्कुल है निधि जी अगर हम अपने आप को उसी तरह से करेंगे जैसे हम उन्नीस सौ से शुरू किए आप नेशन फर्स्ट एकात्म मानववाद अंत्योदय हमारी नीति नियत हमारी जो एक नेतृत्व है जो व्यक्तित्व है उस पर कहीं आप सवाल नहीं उठा सकते हो उस पर सवाल खड़ा करने की ताकत इन लोगों के पास नहीं है ये आंकड़ों की बाजी गरी से देश नहीं चलता है ये राजनीति की दिशा और दशा दोनों बदल चुकी है अगर ये सोचकर कि बीजेपी को इसके वजह से मात देनी है तो मैं ये दावे के साथ कह सकता हूँ कि इनमें किसी में दम नहीं है कि वो किसी भी तरह से हमें जनता से दूर कर सके जनता से दूर करने का चुनौती जो है वो हमेशा बीजेपी के सामने रहेगी कि हम जनता से कनेक्ट रहें हम जनता के लिए काम करें हम उस अंतिम व्यक्ति तक पहुंचे जिसके लिए हमने उन्नीस से अपनी यात्रा शुरू करी थी तो ये हमारी एक बहुत बड़ी चुनौती है दूसरा कि आजादी मिलने के बाद निधि जी ये सबसे बड़ा अगर कोई प्रबल हमारे सामने अगर कोई चुनौती खड़ी हुई तो यही थी कि जो लोग आजादी के नाम पर इस देश में सत्ता का सुख भोगना चाहते थे जिन्होंने पूरी तरह से एक उस परिवार को स्थापित किया उस अपने उस चीज को स्थापित किया आप देखिए ना इस देश में एक प्रधानमंत्री जब ये कहे कि यहाँ के संसाधनों पे सबसे पहले अधिकार जो है मुसलमानों का है तो इस तरह का जब तुष्टिकरण की राजनीति होगी और इस तरह के तुष्टिकरण को जब हम कहीं अच्छे तरीके से उसका मुकाबला कर पाएंगे तभी देश बच पाएगा देश बच पाएंगे देश का विकास डॉक्टर अजय कुमार ऑफ द कांग्रेस इन Uh, that uh, how much of the next election is going to be about you know strategic alliances ajoy kumar where the congress will probably have to swallow its pride a bit and take a back seat look a couple of things one is mr the bjp deals in lies and lies you know the uh, mr manmohan singh statement was for weaker sections of society but and the and the party which says they are nationalists were supporters of the britishers during the freedom struggle so the rss and the bjp have got no right to talk about nationalism i mean it's shameful when they come on tv and start saying nationalism second <laughs> issue is i feel saurabh is jumping the gun at the end of the day we are 688 odd mp uh, mls you might try to run us down the 
the Aam Aadmi Party budget in terms of advertising uh, beats the Bharatiya Janata Party in lots of ways. And we have had very good governments in Chhattisgarh or Rajasthan, other places. And we and Nidhi, the fact is that we recognize that we need to fix certain things ourselves. <laughs> but the fact is that the pan India footprint and and much as the Aam Aadmi Party would like to pretend that they are in a national force, the fact is that. Let's see as the time goes. They they pretended that they were national force in 2019. Uh, if you remember uh, uh, what happened in that election, the challenge to the Congress, which Mr. Chidambaram and all of us have said, is that look, we need to do certain things which are critical. We understand that uh, we need to do it quickly, and that's it. But to say to the Cong and to my BJP friend to say that the Congress is not important first. It's got no one is saying that. I'm only asking uh, you what Mr. Chidambaram actually said. He said on this okay. program that the Congress needs to fight elections state by state, and it needs to allow the TMC to be in the leadership position in Bengal and the Aam Aadmi Party to be in the leadership position in Delhi. He said that. Does no, the party so accept the that? Question again. No, I think the and I totally the I think the 2024 election. Has to be fought in a strategic way. I think Yogendra uh, Ji did a good analysis, but the the issue is very simple. Uh, is the BJP beatable? Yes. Are they awfully corrupt by the by the electoral bonds and all that which is happening in the country? They own all the TV in terms of buying a lot of these TV channels, the newspapers. No, the question is, the most shameless party in the uh, post independence is when they are refused to make the electoral bonds public. Subse brush party the Bharatiya Janata Party. आप इलेक्ट्रोल बॉन्ड्स को पब्लिक कीजिए सी हु आर द इंडस्ट्रियल्स हु आर पेइंग द मनी एंड एंड मेकिंग शो सो निधि द प्रॉब्लम इज ऑल द पार्टीज आर फाइटिंग दिस मोस्ट करप्ट पार्टी सिंस इंडिपेंडेंस विद द इलेक्ट्रोल बॉन्ड्स इज वन ऑफ द वर्स्ट एग्जांपल्स ऑफ ऑफ कटिंग एट द रूट्स ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी लुक एट द एडवर्टाइजमेंट द कोर्ट इज सिटिंग ऑन दैट नो इट्स बीन चैलेंज्ड इन कोर्ट नो बट द क्वेश्चन अगेन निधि इज यू माइट चैलेंज इट इन कोर्ट बट इफ यू आर सो डिसऑनेस्ट एंड दिस प्राइम मिनिस्टर हु कम्स एंड सेस परिवारवाद अगर इफ वांट्स टू स्टॉप व्हाई डज इट स्टॉप इट विद अनुराग ठाकुर व्हाई डज इट महेश जी स्टार्ट विद योर पार्टी इतने भाषण देते हैं जो सिंधिया जी से महेश मह, मह, जी आप सब no, जवाब देंगे जी, no, one sec, one sec, हाँ, okay, okay. मिस्टर प्राइम मिनिस्टर इज सपोज टू बी अ छप्पन इंच नो 56 इंच जेंटलमैन स्टार्ट विद दिस पार्टी रिमूव एक्चुअल परिवारवाद इज व्हाट पीयूष गोयल रवि शंकर प्रसाद अनुराग ठाकुर सिंधिया कुछ नहीं करेंगे भाषणबाजी के लिए देयर इज द प्रॉब्लम इज यू लुक एट द कांग्रेस so the actual parivarwad the prime minister should start with his own party and sangivad which is another parivarwad for as far as we are concerned so start with your party sir ajay ji mera apne parivar se nikaliye parivar ko mai isi nahi nahi pehle ravi shankar prasad anurag thakur ji sabko nikaliye sindhya ji ko nikaliye mahesh ji mahesh ji thoda 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 sun lijiye sun lijiye to aapke bhi kahin kahin aapko bhi samajh mein aayega ki bhai हकीकत क्या है और आपको भी वो चेहरा और चरित्र पार्टी के आपके भी दिखाई देंगे किस हकीकत में आप लोगों ने किया क्या इस देश में आपने आजादी के नाम पर जिस तरह से एक परिवार को नेहरू गांधी परिवार के अलावा और कौन सा परिवार सरदार पटेल का परिवार कहीं दिखाई दिया क्या डॉक्टर राजेंद्र प्रसाद का परिवार कहीं दिखाई दिया क्या दिखाई और दिखाई किसी नेता क्या एक ही गांधी और नेहरू गांधी परिवार ने आजादी की लड़ाई लड़ी थी जिसका नाम लेके और जिसका आप लोग चरणामृत का आजमन कर करके अब राजनीति करने का जो ये सिलसिला शुरू हुआ आजादी के बाद से अब तक उसको क्या कहेंगे परिवारवाद नहीं कहेंगे तो और क्या कहेंगे लेट मी लेट मी तो आस्क यू केंद्र यादव दिस क्वेश्चन लेट मी बिकॉज़ वी गेटिंग जस्टिफाई करेंगे वी गेटिंग इनटू द सेम सॉर्ट ऑफ टेरिटरी ऑफ द डायनेस्टी डिबेट बट यो केंद्र यादव इज आप अ सीरियस चैलेंजर इज आप अ सीरियस चैलेंजर बिकॉज़ लेट्स फेस इट दे आर द ओनली पार्टी नाउ इन द ओपोजिशन दैट अपार्ट फ्रॉम द कांग्रेस व्हिच हैज चीफ मिनिस्टर्स इन टू स्टेट्स so it's the punjab victory is significant and do you see this national expansion plan actually going somewhere uh niti after such a spectacular victory it is obviously uh, obvious the case that uh, aam aadmi party would look at a national expansion and its claims would be taken seriously uh, there are two big challenges that they need that they face one is uh, no matter what they say in public the fact is that their game plan till 24 happens to coincide with bjp's game plan till 24 later on their plans would diverge must diverge but till 24 the main aim of aam aadmi party will be to defeat congress to become the principal challenger and this fits in perfectly with what the bjp would require 
That is one challenge for Aam Aadmi Party. The second challenge is whether Aam Aadmi Party is a non-BJP party or is it an anti-BJP party. The real question is whether it really operates outside the ideological framework of BJP. I will not get into details, but simply say that so far it appears that Aam Aadmi Party has decided, realized, accepted that BJP's Hindutva is the only frame in which politics can be done in this country. And they are trying to be the second vendor in the same game. These are two limitations, but I don't want to get into an argument with my colleague Saurabh, who I've known very well at uh, some point and respected very much. Uh, allow me to just make one more point. I have only 20 seconds, 20 seconds. Which is that the real game is not about coalitions. The game will not be about caste arithmetic. The real challenge for the opposition is to come up with a credible message and credible messengers, yes. especially in the North Indian I, Hindu heart. Absolutely. And not just to hope that the Modi government will make mistakes. I'm, I'm completely out of time. We have an interview coming up with Dr. Shashi Tharoor now. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us today. Thank you. Well, as far as the developments in Ukraine are concerned, India has made its strongest statement on the issue after the civilian killings that have come to the fore in Bucha that have horrified the world. Uh, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar also told Parliament today uh, that India strongly condemned these killings and reiterated India's demand since yesterday for an independent probe. But as there is more and more outrage and the, with the possibility that there could be more killings or more similar killings in other parts of Ukraine, is there more pressure on India now uh, to take a stronger position when it comes to Ukraine and certainly to Russia? Joining us uh, on NDTV today is Lok Sabha MP and former diplomat uh, Shashi Tharoor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tharoor, for joining us. Uh, how do you see India's position on Ukraine? Uh, clearly, there's a shift in terms of it being the strongest condemnation of these killings, uh, but stopping short of actually naming Russia. Yeah, well, because what we've done is we've called for an independent investigation, which is uh, something that could be done under United Nations auspices and perhaps would be a way of saying that we, we would want someone who is not Russian or Ukrainian to decide who's actually culpable. There are an enormous amount of reports on the ground, Nidhi, particularly by your tribe journalists, uh, as well as some NGOs and human rights organizations that seem to leave very little doubt as to who is responsible. But we don't want to appear to be prejudging that. Still, I think it's important that we've sent the signal because it was getting uncomfortable that we were continually um, uh, taking this kind of slightly wishy-washy stand, talking about both sides de-escalating and the importance of peace and diplomacy, uh, whereas there's a war going on and one side is the aggressor. Right. So uh, you're, you're saying that it's not wishy-washy anymore, that you feel this is a more, uh, a, a more firm position by India? Nidhi, our line has toughened noticeably from the very start to today. I mean, it's now been, of course, almost six weeks. But when the war began on the 24th of February, and you and I spoke at that time, we had a situation where the Indian government wasn't even prepared to recall the UN Charter, to talk about uh, preserving the sovereignty of individual member states, to talk about the inviolability of borders, or to object to the um, uh, inadmissible resort to the use of force to resolve the dispute, all of which were cardinal principles that we have upheld not only in our own interests but in the interests of all states in the world. So it really was uh, quite disappointing that we took such a weak step. In the statement since then, even though our vote has not changed, our abstention has remained an abstention, we have injected all of these elements into our position, which surely sends a pretty clear signal uh, to the Russians. On top of that, by today calling for investigation, we are conveying that we are not prepared to take Russian denials at face value. Now, while doing this, our foreign minister indicated in the Lok Sabha today that there is some frank talking going on in private. And of course, that's the best that governments can do. We understand that we can say things privately to the Russians that we would not perhaps wish to embarrass them by saying in public. In public. But you but know, what? when we say things in public, yeah. we are also conveying a signal to the rest of the world. And so the signal the rest of the world gets from our conduct is also important to us. One of the interesting things, though, that you said uh, was that uh, the government should use its influence to mediate a truce. 
uh, between Russia and and Ukraine. Now, in fact, the Ukrainians have said that they would welcome uh, you know any mediation by the Prime Minister uh, if if that was possible. And do you think that you know behind the scenes there is an effort that's already underway? No, there isn't. Yes, an effort. I think, or the or the, or the foreign minister would have would have claimed uh, credit for it. Or for India, I don't blame him. I think, I think the fact that he didn't means that there is, there isn't. But what was interesting is that when Mr. Lavrov was here a few days ago, he himself uh, said to the press that a mediating role uh, would would be feasible for India. Um, why we have not done so remains to be seen. The Turks and the Israelis have been active. Naftali Bennett. The Israeli Prime Minister, who's now in bed with COVID, but before he got COVID, he was shuttling back and forth, and he came up with a 15-point peace plan uh, that he shared with Moscow and, and with the Ukrainians. Uh, the Turks have hosted talks between diplomats on both sides, but not on the highest level. Um, so clearly, some movement is happening, uh, but whether India could have brought more to the party and done so sooner, we'll never know. What's happening at the moment, though, uh, is that India is seen principally as a state that is looking to safeguard its own interest rather than try and play Vishwa Guru on the security council. Well, there's nothing wrong with safeguarding your own interest and other countries do that all the time, which comes to my next question is that, you know, how do you see the sort of sermons that we appear to be getting from the U.S. in particular more and more of late, uh, including on our oil purchases from Russia? I mean, look at Germany. It's still buying a lot of oil from Russia, although they have reduced uh, some of that. But uh, it's not like the entire world has suddenly snapped those links. No, you're quite right, Niti, but let me first say, uh, of course, India is and is, has a duty to look after its own interests. But how do we define our interests? Do we define it narrowly in terms of ensuring we get our citizens out of Ukraine and then we don't want to get involved? Or do we define it over grandly by saying we are Vishwa Guru, we will come and solve all the problems? Or do we find some, some position in between that gives us some influence on the world stage? Don't forget, we are a country that has been clamoring for a seat, a permanent seat on the Security Council. Uh, clearly, if we're not prepared to take a stand on any issue, the world can turn around and say, why do you need the seat? The seat should go to countries that are willing to stand up and be counted. Now, India is a country which, on this kind of issue, could actually play a constructive role, as it could have on the Middle East, because we have relations with both the Israelis and the Palestinians, as it could in a number of situations between Iran and the Americans at one time. But we've not done so. We have been quite remarkably diffident. Now, when you say, uh, are the sermons justified? Of course, they're not. And there is no doubt that India has every right to look to the well-being of its own people, that India has every right that if Russia is offering heavily discounted oil and gas and affordable fertilizer, both of which we need, that we would take it and that we would take it and we would find an arrangement which would not egregiously violate the American sanctions and yet at the same time would uphold our right to treat the Russians as a, as a valuable commercial partner. Now, that is something which I think the government has been handling reasonably well so far, and I'm quite happy to leave them to do it the way they want to. But I do believe that we can stand for more than that in the world, and that's why I suggested that making a mediation effort, being a little more outspoken uh, at the United Nations, as today we were on this whole Bucha tragedy, um, this is something which, which we could do more of, because we mustn't be a state whose silence is taken for granted by offenders. I think we should be a state whose good opinion people are anxious to have, and, 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 and they'll only be anxious to have it if there is a fear that once in a while we'll call them out when they're falling short sure. of the standards that we are right to expect. Let me turn briefly, very briefly, to politics for a minute, because you also put out a tweet today, it's the BJP's Foundation Day, and you reminded them uh, of what their own party's constitution says about taking everyone along and all religions along. Uh, is quite the opposite happening, though, in your view? Yes, I'm, I'm afraid what we're seeing, Nidhi, in our country today is the injection of a toxic, a toxic stain of, of communal uh, bigotry, which is unfortunate because it's actually, as we saw with Kiran Mazumdar Shaw's comment in Bangalore the other day, it's actually bad for economic growth, it's bad for development. A lack of communal harmony can damage our society, can drive away investors, so it, it's, not even, it's not even good for anyone in our country, not even the BJP and the government. But they have this very short-term thinking that they can win elections by polarizing the electorate, by consolidating enough elements of Hindu opinion on an Islamic phobic agenda in order to be able to go ahead and, and get enough votes to win. 
Uh, they're doing this in Karnataka because the election's looming in Karnataka early next year. Uh, they've done it in the past in UP and elsewhere. Uh, is this what our country should be reduced to? And the irony of the BJP constitution is that it has the most lofty ambitions and it uses language which would be unexceptionable for any of the so-called secular parties. But they say that and they completely disregard it. And that's what's so sad. So I was just reminding them that they, at least on paper, stand for something more than they're actually doing in practice today. One final question. Do you have any thoughts on Sharad Pawar's meeting with the Prime Minister today? Because that certainly set or, or journalists a buzz in Delhi. Maybe we don't have enough work to do, but how do you see it? I I'm sorry, I didn't hear you terribly well. The sound went in. Who's meeting with the Prime Minister? Sharad Pawar's. It's not the first time, right? I mean, he's done so on many occasions. He's, he's, he's an elder statesman now in our politics. And I think we don't need to overreact. Uh, he will tell us uh, in due course when it suits him what he was there to discuss. But as the leader of a uh, of, a, of a significant party and, uh, and a presence in Indian politics who's held various portfolios from Chief Minister of Maharashtra in his 30s to Defence Minister in his 50s. This is a man who has earned the right um, to be received by the Prime Minister of India, whoever the Prime Minister is at any time. So I have all respect for Mr. Pawar and we'll see what comes out of this. But clearly uh, the NCP has repeatedly uh, averred its opposition to the BJP as a political party and its commitment to the MBA alliance in Maharashtra. And I'm very happy to take Mr. Pawar at his word on both those things. All right, Shashi Tharoor, thanks very much for joining us on NDTV today. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi.